Yeah, I haven't seen all... Captain Marvel yet. Ooh, that was really good. Did you like it? Yeah, I liked that a lot. I would recommend it to <laughs> all of the listeners. <laughs> <laughs> all of them. Yeah. You guys know about those uh, unboxing movies for kids or whatever, where it's like movies of people opening thing, opening presents or playing with toys, and like kids are into them. So I have, I have, I have something to tell you. Yeah, it's not just for kids. <laughs> 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 these are these are things. These are legit. Yeah, these are legit things I mean, that I people know watch. So I, I've watched. A, I've watched a fair amount. Yeah, like. Like what? What was the most recent one? You oh, watched? geez. You know, there's like little like n- nerdy collectibles, like people okay. getting their like, you know, their movie uh, prop or whatever, and they'll take it out and like turn yeah. it on and stuff. Like I've watched a couple of those. I'm I mean, I've lie. watched them, but it's it's always for a purpose of like, how do I blank? You know, like if there's a thing you need to know, it's it's like that's, utilitarian, not just like a pleasure. Oh, that's very practical. Practical. <laughs> yeah, I am an engineer. So. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's that. <laughs> it has yes. to have a purpose. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Which is why you're here. Sure. Engineer. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> good segue. <laughs> Sarah, is it Goodman? Goodman? Goodman is how I Goodman. say it. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's a married name, so it's open to interpretation for me. <laughs> but Goodman, Goodman is how I say it. And you're a mechanical engineer? Mechanical engineer. Yeah. How long have you been doing mechanical engineering? Um, well, I got my PE in 2011, I think. So mm-hmm. like I've been a professional mechanical engineer for some years now. And then, um, I think I've been like in the industry almost 13 years. Okay. So the, the sort of philosophy of this podcast is a, keep it casual. We're going to keep it casual. I think we're succeeding. And then we're, yeah, yeah we yeah. are very much succeeding. Good <laughs> warm up there at the beginning where I we're feel, talking yeah. about, um, and, uh, uh, you know, the intent is to cr- create some kind of more natural, organic, critical dialogue about the building industry, number one, but mm-hmm. then technology processes and, and kind of trends and evolutions, um, number two. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm personally getting a high amount of social media fatigue and event fatigue because you, know, you go to a, an event and you see presentations, everyone's like talking about how cool they are and all right. the stuff they're doing that's right. really good. And then... Um, on Twitter, everything is like these really condensed, um, yeah, See, discussion people points. People feel like they've got like marketing is number one. Marketing is number, number one. Number one consideration yeah. rather than functionality and actually being something that people might yeah. use and being honest about how you might use it well versus how you might just end up frustrated and annoyed. Yeah. I think it's easy to get into that marketing <laughs> trap, though. Like people, like, can, you know, you want to sell yourself, you want to present yeah. yourself in X, Y, Z way. But like, I mean, recently, even I mean, even as recently as this past year, I've kind of got to a point where it's like, let's just put it out there. Like, let's, you know, because people get the ideas out. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Especially like with energy modeling, um, people or sometimes I don't know, not like you don't withhold information about like, well, what software do you use? That's a question people ask like okay. modelers a lot. Right. Well, what software do you use? And and like it's like if you do or don't give that information, then you're giving away some kind of trade secret. And it's like, well, not really. Like it's, so I think I'm all about that. Like put, put the information out there, like for the world. Cause I'm all about like the betterment of the world. Right. Mm-hmm. So I feel like if more people have more information. Yeah. Then everybody can just get better. I think that's like one of the, right? I mean, there, there is like that, that side of the industry. And I think architects and engineers, people in the building industry tend to, tend to have that spirit in general like people i think when you're doing stuff in the built environment no one wants to make a crappy environment right everyone wants to make like something better but there is a lot of like and then the built, lawyers get involved yeah but then yeah <laughs> then there's like you know there's all sorts right. of things that i think then hold us back in terms yeah. of like old liability structures and like mm-hmm. kind of contract uh, risk aversion right and what no, you can and can't promise what mm-hmm. you can and can't promise yeah. which is yeah. which is a very interesting kind of space to get into when we talk about energy modeling because all of a sudden you're talking about simulating a building mm-hmm. to predict performance um and then the big question is what if the building doesn't do right. what the model says and then right. like all that stuff you know i think that's an interesting thing to kind of get into but the other side of this podcast that i was really keen on doing at least at, at the start was bringing people that are doing interesting work from the midwest to the table um 
Mm -hmm. I, I lived and worked in Los Angeles for a number of years. There's always like really cool stuff happening on the coast um, and in, in bigger cities. And mm -hmm. people talk about that stuff all the time. But there's also really interesting things happening here in Omaha and really interesting professionals such as yourself. Um, oh, and I like you. to think, and I like to think proving grounds. And you, and you guys, yeah, too, I was going to so. say, you guys too. <laughs> well, whenever I bring you guys up, you guys proving ground, uh, up to people, you know, people are really intrigued, I think by what you're doing and you're, you're kind of operating in that realm, you know, the Venn diagram between like the design world and like the computational world. And so people, you know, there is not another company, certainly not here, like what you guys are doing. So I think people are really intrigued by that, Yeah, especially in the Midwest. Mm -hmm. I wish they were more intrigued because we don't have too much business really? here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no. We have like most of our clients are far, far away. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you know, it's it, that's it's that's kind of an. I mean, I think it starts to speak to. I think there's a general awareness problem mm -hmm. for like really innovative stuff. Oh yeah. And, I mean, and um, and and getting the word out there because you know when number one the economy is really good right now, so people have I feel maybe it's a. It, it's challenging because I think people sometimes have in a very good economy less of an incentive to improve because they're like, hey, we're making money. We're moving yeah, along. like things are going. And things you're busy, right? Yeah, it's, and hard, it's busy. hard to improve when you're busy. Right. It's hard to so. justify spending the time right. when you've got X, Y, and Z. Things just have to get done. Breathing down your throat. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and that we're going through, like we're all doing the, the Gallup strengths thing now at our yeah. office. Oh, and no. so, yeah. So I, I am a maximizer, right? So it's like, oh, I want everything to be done in the best possible way. Mm -hmm. But like, it's, you know, it's when, when is good enough, good enough, you know? And then, mm -hmm. and in my mind, it's like, well, it's never good enough, but it's hard to just, yeah. when you're busy, yeah. right? Yeah. Just get stuff, get stuff out the door, yeah. get it done. But the question of good enough is, is, you know, and I think this is ingrained in, especially, you know, architects and engineers. It's like, you want it to be perfect. Mm-hmm. Um, programmers too, though. Programmers too, but They're then you know, in always the, giving each other a hard time about how, oh, you didn't do it the way that I would do it. You yeah, know? software development. But there are different all, ways to do things too, right? I think it's, I think so, it's maybe it's yeah. a creatives problem if yeah. you're kind of in in, in, yeah. a, in a creative space, mm -hmm. like knowing when to stop, right? Um, and knowing, you know, when to take a step back and be like, okay, this is good enough. I need to get it out the door, right? Um, or when to hold it in. You know, we always have. We always see the struggle with uh, some of the tools we make um, or when we kind of evaluate, I think, more specifically like at a firm and the things that they're doing. You know, a lot of firms are doing really cool stuff, mm -hmm. but they have a really hard problem taking this cool stuff to a scale that is um, to the point where, you know, they, they roll it out to their company or they roll it out to or roll out a certain pro set of processes. And they're like, well, why haven't you pushed this out to like, you've got maybe two people using this process here. Why mm -hmm. haven't you rolled it out to the 50 people that are kind of that we could really benefit from it's like oh well you know it doesn't do x y and z mm -hmm. um and it's like well you know don't let you know perfect get in the way of good like right. figure out a way mm -hmm. to yeah iterate and and get it out there and then improve upon it over time because i know this is right like, i mean that's i think that's really the opportunity is to you know put something out there and then next time you do it improve on it right like it's those incremental improvements right instead of if you just hold it back till it's perfect then it might not ever happen mm -hmm. yeah especially if you're busy yeah, right. which which actually brings me to one of the first things I wanted to talk about was this. You put out a, a, a blog on LinkedIn. Um, what the hell is energy modeling? Is that the... right? I mean, I use the acronym. Yeah, I didn't use the word hell because <laughs> it's a professional. It's a professional networking <laughs> site. <laughs> I, I mean, and I had a different acronym that I was going to use too. Yeah, uh, and I have I do have a follow up post for that that I've draft I drafted like six months after I wrote that. Then it was nine months after, and then today I opened it. I was like, "Oh, maybe I should finish this." Uh, but so, yes, so, I have that post. Yeah. So the, the article was is interesting because it, it frames different tiers of energy modeling. Um, and I think you know, I think a lot of firms that we work with and these people I've come across kind of will talk about the, you know, how much investment tends to go into creating a really good energy model, and oftentimes right. this like the accuracy of a model is is really obviously it's really important in, in like later stages of design and development sure. and things like that um and so it usually gets offloaded to later parts of the process when the 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 important stuff the important decisions that need to get made about a project are typically earlier on and right. you, and your post did a really nice job i thought of breaking down different types of energy models when they get used and, and why they're important maybe could you talk about that a little bit like sure the, yeah i mean this is kind of 
I don't know when I wrote that post. I mean, probably it was about a year ago, I mm -hmm. guess. And so, um, I mean, I've just kind of constantly talking about like constantly Im improving things and processes. And that's, I guess, kind of my nature. Um, so I've been thinking about this for a while now. And I think when I, you know, when I wrote that post, I wasn't even aware of like ASHRAE standard 209, which has been released since then. And it details like seven modeling cycles and how, you know, it would integrate into the design process. And it's, you know, it's a standard, so it's kind of structured rigidly mm -hmm. and things like that. But um, <laughs> I mean, broadly. right, right. <laughs> like in terms of like, you're right. Like when can we impact those big design decisions? Like it is earlier on, but also when things are happening so early, you, you have to be able to react really quickly, right? Mm -hmm. You can't, like our traditional energy modeling approach um, in the context of like lead is when, you know, you're building a model at like 90, 95% construction document phase. And, you know, the procedure would be, oh, I'm the energy modeler. Uh, here's my list of, you know, a hundred things that you need mm -hmm. to give me. I need like complete sequences of operation for all the HVAC systems. I need to know the occupancy and the occupancy schedule of the building. And by that phase in the project, usually somebody's thought through that. But mm -hmm. early on, you know, we might not even have a massing of the building yet. So it's like how the question, how mm -hmm. do you run a model then? And so I think, I mean, I thought identifying those different phases was important so mm -hmm. that people know that it's possible and they exist. Mm -hmm. um, so I think early on, you know, conceptual modeling is, you know, it could happen anytime, really. It could happen as early as you just have a building idea. It's going to be a, you know, X square foot school and this many stories. And we're not sure what massing it, you know, we should take or what orientation or what the window to wall ratio should be. And like, those are all things where I like to say, like, we, we just want to provide feedback, right? Mm -hmm. Like, we're not going to I'm not going to drive the design in any way because mm -hmm. uh, I'm not an architect, but like, <laughs> I mean, I'm an engineer, right? So I like what our engineers are good at. We're good at like, we'll take a bunch of information, we'll process it, we'll, you know, give it back to you. And I think, um, you know, but kind of back to the what software do you use question, right? Like, I think, I think of energy modeling ultimately is more of a process, right? Like we're going through these phases and cycles of the project. So, you know, you're going to be involved. You're going to kind of touch the model at the different phases and you might use different tools throughout that mm -hmm. process. Um, but it doesn't really matter like ultimately what software you're using, like what matters is kind of how you're communicating the results and mm -hmm. what information you're able to kind of glean from the conversations that you're having. Mm -hmm. So I can think of, um, you know, situations I've been in, um, even in our own office where, you know, we're being asked to do a model and no, nobody can give us any information. Right. Okay. So like. Yeah. <laughs> You know, people will say, well, we want to meet the 2030 challenge. And so we need to know what's the EUI of this building going to be. <clears throat> and um, and then we, you know, the typical response, like the engineer response is, well, what's the, what kind of glazing are you going to use? <laughs> right. And and at that stage, it's like, well, I don't know. And right. And so then. Or it, super early on what building? Yeah. Right. Like what kind of glazing? <laughs> what's the wall you value? You know, like we want to take, we want that information. And, and if it's not available, then, you know either you're okay with making an assumption or you're not. And uh -huh. if you're not really comfortable with like, what are the typical things that we could put in and, you know, make these assumptions at this point based on these previous, you know, projects or previous knowledge, then mm -hmm. you can kind of get like stalled out there. So I think it's, it's really a different mindset thinking about early phase modeling compared to like documentation modeling. Well, the, the assumptions part has always been <clears throat> really interesting to me um, because it, it, it kind of makes, Obviously, energy modeling is backed up by science. There's like, there's like this yeah. sort of element like of science. Scientists. You know, there's yeah. like scientists and yeah. there's like you know <laughs> equations and stuff in the background of a lot of, right. of these energy modelers. But you use the word assumptions, right? Which kind of to me starts to talk. You know, gets into the sort of the art of energy modeling. Like the engineer and you know the team needs to make certain assumptions about how this building is going to perform and right. and and what's going to go into it. Yeah. And so it creates a, kind of a gray area. Um so can we explain some of that process yeah. like like you you kind of you know you're using experience, you're bringing experience to bear on like what assumptions to make and um yeah. Well, I mean I think the the single biggest variable, you know, in a building is always people, right? So even if, you know, designing a mechanical system, like you could design the best system in the world, but if people come into the building and operate it in a way that it wasn't intended to operate, you know, if they're cranking down the air conditioning or turning the heat way up, it's not going to be energy efficient. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I think nailing down occupancy schedules and how do people move through the building and, mm -hmm. 
and having those conversations, um, and you know, a lot of times maybe the the end user doesn't even know how they're going to use the building, right? So yeah. that's another it's mm-hmm. another element. Um, but so I think I like that you use the word art, the art of energy modeling, because there is, I mean, an art to it too, and a lot of things that we do as engineers kind of come down to there's that gray area where you have to rely on your experience and kind of feel it out more than like just the hard numbers of things, you know, like water heater sizing is another example of, Mm -hmm. right. The art, uh, the art of engineering. But, um, yeah, I think there's, you know, there's standards out there and guides on, you know, what typical, you know, occupancy schedules Mm -hmm. are even, you know, how often are the elevators operated in an office building and Mm -hmm. things like that, that, I think presenting that information and using it as a talking point has been really effective mm-hmm. too in the past. Cause I think people say, you know, if you just go to somebody and say, well, how are, how are you going to use this building or what hours are you going to be in here? It's, it's not usually something that people can always answer sometimes, mm-hmm. you know, but sometimes not. Um, but if you present information, then people have a chance to react to it. Okay. It's kind of what I've found mm-hmm. a lot more. So what do you, what do you see like, you know, from the, like the early stages where there are more assumptions to make, there are more unknowns um, that need to be accounted for um, versus like later stage energy modeling where the design's more figured out. Are you seeing any trends in in your work or the work of others uh, in terms of like what the delta is? I mean, in in terms of like when an energy model is run early on versus later on, um, do these results and like things vary pretty wildly or are are engineers and the the design discipline is getting better at kind of predicting early on what the assumptions of the buildings are. Therefore, you know, you can rely on those models a little bit more. Yeah. I think, um, it's kind of a two part thing. Like, so I, I think it's really important. Like once we, we make these assumptions, these early assumptions, we, you know, we run a model then at the next phase, like the next cycle or phase in that modeling document what changed, right? Because Mm -hmm. things change throughout the design process. And um, when people come back and say, well, why is the energy use intensity different or why is the Mm. cost different Then what are the things that changed? Right. So this is all about presenting information, having that conversation, like in terms of the total accuracy of models, you know, when we're doing a like a lead model, um, if you go back and check the energy after post occupancy, I think like a 10 to 15 percent accuracy is like a pretty good model. Right. Okay. Um, but I think that this this process, like we're still kind of so much at the forefront of tracking energy modeling through design that I don't feel like I personally have really good data on like how much is it changing from whoop, from phase to phase. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> microphone. Uh, you know, and but that's certainly a thing I've seen on projects where we start out, you know, the EUI was going to be a 35 and then, oh, we changed the mechanical system. We changed this. We mm-hmm. changed that. And now we're at a 50. And so I mean, when people say, well, wait a second, now we're not meeting that goal. It's like, okay, well, here's all the reasons why. And so mm-hmm. it's never just, I mean, people want it to be like a, you know, an easy answer. Like, oh, it's because we changed blank. Like the one yeah. thing, right? But it's like it's, a laundry list of a dozen yeah, things or yeah. more. It's yeah. so, there's so many things. And, and they um, all affect it. Yeah. They all affect it in different ways and different percentages. So um, is that answering your question? Yeah, no, no, that's yeah. perfect. No, um, it's, it, it, it's always interesting to me to think about deltas between, you know, the different phases of design. You know, we see, you know, assumptions about program being made, like right. the, the building program being made in early design. And then, you know, the, 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 depending on the, the project and the client, uh, you know, scope gets cut, scope gets added, buildings yeah. grow, buildings Have you shrink. tracked that? Like through, have you been able to track how well, that changes? Well, we, you know, we do, uh, certain forms of model analysis. So we will often be working with a firm and, um, you know, we'll do periodic harvests of, of like building information models. And that kind of gives us some level of insight into that. Um, and it's certainly a thing that a lot of firms are interested in, in, in tracking mm-hmm. over time. Um, and in some projects it's kind of critical. Like, you know, there's a popular project type in Canada called a P3 uh, I don't know if it was a public private partnership. Oh, okay. Um, oftentimes, uh, just really large, uh, projects like big medical center or a prison or things like that kind of mm. might, might get the public private partnership treatment. Okay. And you're given like a pretty massive space list at the front end, like of what actually needs to be included because, you know, P3s are very rigorous about tracking, like, you know, every space is accounted for right. and, um, you know, there's very fixed costs. Um, because of how these projects are financed. And so teams need to be very rigorous about like when you're um, even doing initial planning and concept design that, you know, you're accounting for everything and the delta can't be um, a certain within, you know, can't go beyond a certain percentage of change. 
Um, and so in those cases, you see um, teams deploying tools like DROFUS and other um, like space management tools to kind of help them track things space to space. Um, but then there are like other typologies that it's just kind of all over the map, you know, uh, developer projects in particular, I think have a lot of variation because there's a lot of what ifs, right. you know, it's like, when I imagine you know. like the meetings that are happening down the road, right. Where it's like, Oh, by the way, we need blank. And then it's like, how does that affect yeah. all the, all the calculations and the, right. The space planning. Yeah. You know, my wife, uh, does a lot of, of, of commercial projects. She's an architect at HDR and, um, uh, you know, she'll, she'll talk about, oh, well, you know, we, we just added a whole new set of, of retail spaces and now I need to refigure like, right. you know, these, these things. And, mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, there's, oh, there's uh, even to the point where there's like, oh, there's a speculative development out there. We don't even know if it's going to be a real project, but we have to like develop something for it. And then right. if we, and if it ends up moving forward, it's going to change all, you know, um, all, all those things. All are the everything. Yeah. All the everything. Yeah. Yeah. Every yeah. So, <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I think having mechanisms for tracking, these changes is also kind of interesting because on a P3 project, you kind of want to demonstrate that you're, mm -hmm. you've got a, your team is tight knit. Right. And you're on top of everything. Right. Um, and <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm sure there's similar, like if you go back to energy modeling, you know, there's probably certain typologies where that's the case. You need to be able to like, if you're going into a new project, you know, does that ever become a question? Like a track record of being able to say, Hey, our models are, yeah. Um, this good. Um, are you seeing anything like that? We haven't. So like in the design area, you know, we haven't really got to that level yet. Cause I think as you know, design engineers and consultants, like we historically as an industry, haven't done a super great job of like following up with buildings after the fact, you mean like yeah. post occupancy? Well, yeah, I guess kinda, I guess, I guess yeah, kind verification. of verification, right? Yeah, yeah. There's a bit of verification inside of that. So a whole other conversation. Yeah, yeah. And, and I think, um, you know, we kind of when in the past we've approached it like, if there, if it's nobody saying anything, it's probably working fine. You know, right. I, I kind of, I always yeah. tell people like people come job shadow and I say, um, you know, we kind of work in the arena of the invisible as mechanical engineers, right? Mm -hmm. Like we're behind the scenes, you know, air, there's air in here and temperature yeah. and humidity. And, yeah. and if we, if we do our jobs like really, really well, nobody notices right. anything about it. Nobody it's like, notices no anything. Notice it. Yeah. It's like Nobody's set gonna design. Know. Yeah. It, you know, it fades into the background ding. and lets people yeah. have just a great experience. But if something's mm -hmm. wrong, They'll you know, let you know. You're going to know. <laughs> so I think going back to a building that's in operation and nobody's saying something's wrong to be like, how's it going in here, guys? Like, isn't the thing that people have done a lot in the past, but I think we're seeing it more. And so, you know, with, especially with like meeting 2030 challenge or meeting specific energy targets, um, it's something we're just trying to do more of. It's not like currently a, a service that people get paid for either, mm -hmm. right? So in terms of a time investment, it's something that you kind of have to do on your own as a firm for the data and the information to be mm -hmm. able to tell that story. Like, I think that's really important. Mm -hmm. Um, but it has, uh, you know, it's kind of a thing on the, like the ESCO side of things when, you know, people have to pay for the project out of the savings and somebody has to calculate what those savings are to figure out how much they get paid. But the person that's calculating the savings is also the person getting paid by the, mm -hmm. you know, so there's that, <laughs> um, there's that, but, I, um, I mean, I don't have to do a lot of that type of modeling, luckily, like I'm, I'm kind of familiar with it, but I think, you know, there's a lot of assumptions and I mean, we've talked about people in buildings, right. Being the biggest variable, but the other thing people always gravitate to is weather, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like, oh, well the weather was different. So how does that affect because right. that's it's using getting to climate. be way different. You're using right. climate to be data. Different. <laughs> yeah. right. You're using climate data to to approximate what might happen, and then the weather yeah. may or may not actually. I mean, be we use this like anywhere typical, near the average. The TMY files, right? Typical meteorological meteorological <laughs> year. It's a typical year, and so yeah. and those change. You know, those are released. There's different years. So like, I was at a conference last week, um, like the USGBC's regional conference, and. I, you know, we were talking about climate and I actually wrote a note to myself of like a, just, I have all these random ideas for things to do. And uh -huh. I'm like, we should run a model using different climate data and figure out what that Delta, what's that savings Delta, mm -hmm. just only changing climate data, uh -huh. right? Yeah. Like using different mm -hmm. TMY files. I mean, that's what meteorologists are doing as far as they have like the European model and the, the American model of, to, to, to predict the weather, right? use different models and then take the average or the most popular result coming out of it. Right. So, yeah. I mean, and yeah. that's, that's the thing. There's a lot of guidance that currently exists on, mm. you know, modeling processes and, and like lead, uh, is the most stringent, right. When it comes to energy modeling. 
Um, but even they don't say specifically what weather file to use. Well, you know, when you're mm -hmm. doing the reporting, you just say, this is the weather file I use because, you know, you're comparing your building to a baseline building. And so it's yeah. the same weather file for the, both models. But like in terms of like predictive modeling, which mm -hmm. is kind of a different category, mm -hmm. um, and that's not really something people ask for a lot. Um, but yeah, it's the weather, the weather and the people mm -hmm. important. Well, the weather, the what. <laughs> As you're talking climate, about the climate, as you're talking about the weather and the climate, the climate, the climate, the climate, right? All right, we don't want to mess those. We don't want to conflate the those two. The weather and the climate. It was so cold this winter. Where's that global warming? Right. I know. Um, Where, <laughs> where is it? <laughs> but that actually brings up a point because if if the so if we look at if we look at that situation, climate's changing. Um, are are you seeing any impacts on? like the ability to run a good energy model. Like if, if the, the assumptions and especially in certain regions and we're kind of due to see some rather significant mm -hmm. changes, you know, um, in, in the near term, we're kind of seeing it now. Yeah. Like, is that, does that, does that affect the energy modeling process? Are you seeing those effects yet? Yeah. And we're, I mean, we're having those conversations on projects too of, um, I mean, things that seem intuitive in terms of, uh, cause HVAC, like system sizing and selection and mm -hmm. modeling, like energy modeling, they're all kind of related, right? So we run like load calculations and energy modeling, and mm -hmm. they're kind of happening in parallel. Um, but we just went through an exercise recently on a building that had a very high window to wall ratio, like lots of glass. And, uh, and it was a whole deal about, well, if we're talking about um, downsizing the air handlers on the first cost side, you know, that's a thing versus mm -hmm. the energy, you know, the peak load sizing versus the ongoing energy sizing. Cause like in our climate, um, we're heating driven climate. So mm -hmm. if you want to reduce total building energy, you have to look at the heating side of things. But if we're trying to drive down like equipment sizing or cost or peak load on a design day, mm -hmm. you know, which is driving airflow through the building and duct sizing and, you know, then that's cooling. Right. So I think being knowledgeable enough to have that conversation and talk about the difference, mm -hmm. you know, between energy and, you know, peak load and peak, you know, these are all, these are all things that, that matter. Um, and so, yeah, I, I think we're, we're certainly talking about it more. And, uh, I mean, the other, I guess the other part of that, which is actually described in the energy code is, you know, in indoor design conditions, right? Like mm -hmm. people want you to design the building to be 70 degrees in the summertime indoors, but the energy yeah. code says we have to design it to 75. So we have that conversation all the time on projects, you know, uh -huh. when that's a, you know, a call you might get, oh, the building, I can't get it down to 72 or 70. And it's, you know, the building's fully loaded and it's a July day and yeah. it's only 75 in here. And it's like, well, yeah, that's what the energy code says we should design to. It was like a responsible professional. <laughs> like, so, <laughs> I mean... Talk about communicating information effectively. Yeah. Like that's not yeah. a call you want to get after the fact and be like, oh, by the way, we never talked about this during design. Yeah. You know, because they think, well, I paid for a building that works and works is works is relative, right? right. So, right. you know, we're getting into thermal comfort now, but like there's <laughs> there's that. I mean, that's a whole thing. Like we do we do quarterly uh, indoor environmental surveys in our office. Okay. So I send those out. Um, we look at like thermal comfort, humidity lighting, acoustics, like we, you know, survey all the things. And, um, you know, and I, at this presentation I just gave recently, I kind of snapshotted the results from like January and July. Like mm -hmm. people, people joke about like, oh, you just wait till the, the hottest day of the summer and send this out. And I'm like, well, I don't, I don't purposely do that, but then it, it does happen a lot. Like <laughs> yeah. in, you know, in July, it's, in July. it's hot. Yeah. <laughs> it's hot in July. <laughs> Newsflash. No, but like uh -huh. the, Yeah. <laughs> Right? I think it's hot in July. I'll be thinking about that one tonight. Whereas, yeah. <laughs> deep deep <laughs> thoughts. Deep, deep thoughts from proving it. Yeah. <laughs> it's hot in July. It's hot in July. <laughs> um, but so we, people, you know, we ask people to rate their thermal comfort on a scale of like one to mm. seven. So, you know, on and the scale goes from like it's really cold to really hot, basically. Uh -huh. uh, and, you know, and we still see in July, people are saying I'm really cold in here. Yeah. And in, you know, winter, people are saying I'm really hot in here. So it's, you know, we kind of design for 80% satisfaction. Like on the design side, it's like, okay, well, people are 80% of the people are good. Then like per, you know, ASHRAE standard 55, like then that's a, that's a good design. That's an okay design. Mm -hmm. But like, you know, we know the real world doesn't operate like that. Like if yeah. the, if the, <laughs> if the wrong person isn't comfortable, you know, then 
that's a fail, right? Yeah. In some ways. So I think, I mean, I, we've kind of gone on this tangent now, but like <laughs> personal. Where's that thermostat? Right. Like personal <laughs> comfort devices. Like, have you guys seen that, the chair? I don't know if it's like LBNL, but it's like a personal thermal chair that oh, so it right. has like yeah. heating and air conditioning it's integrated like, into the really? chair. Yeah. yeah. Like my, my husband's truck has a heating and cooled seat. It's like that. It's like but that, in but an office. Like an office chair. Yeah. Wow. Right. Yeah. I haven't seen this. It's, yeah. Should Proving Ground invest in <laughs> personal comfort? Personal comfort devices? Like. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Right. That sounds fabulous. <laughs> well, so think about like how we should. Looking how we, for a way to burn through cash <laughs> right. over here. I think they're pretty cheap, probably. <laughs> probably. <laughs> think about how we, uh, like how we condition buildings typically, right? Like we're mm -hmm. just, we're blowing air around in a space. Mm -hmm. You know, and I, and I tell people like, well, we don't. We're not adding cooling. We're taking heat out of a space, right? Like right. we're not, you know, when we do HVAC design, we're not adding cooling. We're taking heat out. We're moving the heat, taking the heat away in the summer and adding in the winter. But like air is, a, air is an insulator, right? Like, yeah. so to try to condition people through the air, it's like, and everybody at the same temperature in a static condition, like yeah. I, I think we're going to see the industry really like move forward into, you know, microclimates and personal comfort devices and things like that. So it's like, wouldn't, wouldn't it make a lot more sense to give everybody their own chair yeah. and let them control yeah. their environment and then run the background air temperature to something different? Sort of hyper-personalization. You yeah. know, my, one of my uh, good friends, Andy Payne, um, uh, he's a background in architecture, um, but he was, he was, he's known uh, in like the computational design community and like in you know, the software um, CAD, BIM communities as being someone who is really interested in sensors and he did, uh, you know, some work in his, you know, during his uh, PhD work at Harvard, um, with, uh, using sensors. Um, he has this really cool prototype for a fan okay. and, and he kind of has, he has, he has this whole narrative about, um, how, how dumb the typical fan is, right? It just sort of blows this way. Mm -hmm. And it blows like an oscillating fan. Yeah, yeah. the oscillating fan just when blowing, it's blowing one way. on you. I'm like, I'm it, freezing. Yeah, and then when it goes away, I'm too hot. Like, uh, so, yeah. so um, he started using um, like uh, I can't remember like what specific technology. This is like kind of made like an Arduino um, and sort of set of sensors that will actually do. It actually combined I think face tracking technology oh, yeah. and the fan. Yeah, not so, creepy at all. So the fan is basically <laughs> at your desk. It's a small desk fan, and as you're moving, the thing is just kind of tracking you and you know, maintaining consistent airflow mm -hmm. on you at, at all times. And so it starts to become this interesting way of, yeah, a creepy, like you have, a, yeah, you have this device I mean, that's yeah, kind of following right. you. But at the same time, it's like, you know, it speaks to the hyper-personalization, sort of mm -hmm. like totally. you know, following your behavior. Yeah. Um, and and building sen like sensors and smart devices and IoT, I think, all start to play into this as well, right? I mean, are you, yeah. what, what are you seeing on like building control systems? Are there things that are happening on that front or that you've been involved in that kind of, instead of like doing like the post, everyone talks about the post occupancy, mm -hmm. right? And it's like involves like going into a building and like you were saying like, measure, hey, how you doing everyone? Yeah. I'm going to measure all your data. Can you fill out my survey? Yeah. Can, <laughs> oh, and then, you know, and there's like, you know, oh, there, there's uh, four people over there right. at the desk. Check uh, the lights. Uh, what are Check they doing? The, oh, yeah. they're on their computer. Um, they look all right. <laughs> you know, um, but now you have sensors that kind of, you know, in, and there are, I think we're yeah. going to have a, a future session about, you Figuring know, out the creepiness factor. There is. And the, yeah. yeah. Oh, it's, totally. That's a huge problem. But, it's a huge, huge nut to crack. Mm -hmm. But it's giving it, but it, yeah, it's, yeah, exactly. But it's also like, it's giving this unprecedented data about how people are using right. buildings. Yeah. Um, and, and, and I, I kind of think about like this context of creating a good model um, of something and being able to predict performance in some right. way, um, or even potentially extending an, an architect's or engineer's services into the, into the, the sort of the maintenance or the kind of a long, long term yeah. life cycle of a building. Like, I mean, that's interesting too. You bring that up because that's something, um, you know, we're getting into discussions on more for commissioning services, uh -huh. like kind of, you know, thinking about buildings in operation and, um, you know, the aging building maintenance engineering staff of the world, right? Like, so, you know, and the, the trades shortage and things mm -hmm. like that. So, mm. um, I mean, oftentimes what we see is, you know, like think of a school district and you have like one or two people, um, you know, experienced building managers that are responsible for 30 or 40 buildings. And yeah. so it's like, they just like literally cannot or do not have all the skills they need to manage all those buildings effectively. So then 
all the work that, that we're doing on the design side sometimes ends up going out the window if it's not communicated to that person or if that person just can't keep up. So I think that that, that will be a thing that architects and engineers will, you know, hmm. start to kind of extend services into operation of buildings because like the workforce isn't there to manage those. And as these buildings get more complicated, uh -huh. then it's going to be, it's going to be more critical to make sure that the, they're operating per the design intent. And then mm -hmm. for us as design professionals, I think it makes sense to get that data back, right. To understand how these projects are operating in performance. And I think people are, you know, really interested in, in getting that data. And then, you know, you mentioned control systems and mm -hmm. kind of like smart, smart building controllers. Um, I think it's people recognize it as a problem, right? But like, how do you how do you tackle it and like feed that back into the operation of the building and mm -hmm. make it react in in clever ways? Like, I think that's that's kind of something that's happening, but it's still maybe in its infancy a little bit in mm -hmm. terms of like feeding into the design side of things. But like, there's some cool technology. Um, have you guys seen that Aware device? No. It's A W A I R, <clears throat> and. Uh, this is my this is my plug for them. I, I they do not they do not pay me. <laughs> where they where they where they where are they based out? They're of? based out of um, California somewhere. But I I mean I call them uh, like the Apple of indoor air quality monitors, which is funny because I think some other people maybe used to work at Apple. So check them out. <laughs> um, but I mean it's a cool uh, indoor air quality sensor. So it does temperature, humidity, CO two, VOCs, and particulates like PM two point five. Uh -huh. And I mean I think. And, you know, historically, if we wanted all that data in a room, it'd have to be like a bunch of separate devices on the wall, which like, A, doesn't look good. Like, you know, B, you have to specify all that and pay for it. Yeah. So this is like mm -hmm. a, you know, lower cost device. Like it looks cool because like thermostats, I'm looking at the thermostat over there. Thermostats oh, don't look beautiful. great, right? No. Like yeah. we can say that. They don't look great. So it's tan, kind of tan -ish. Yeah. It's, um, and it's, it's vintage 1985. The cover, the cover is missing. So you guys can, <laughs> yeah. I don't know what happened to that cover. I don't think it was ever there. Yeah. I think I thought there was something that was like hanging on it, but I don't know. That's like a yeah, they did they but it's a, if only if only our viewers could see right. our thermostat. There's a, there's a lock box. But I think like frame <laughs> with no cover. It is like a frame. It's like a picture frame. Yeah. <laughs> Well, Look at our clear, thermostat. Clear, clearly, the previous tenant had an issue with people adjusting the thermostat because there and was a lockbox lock like, around. Uh, right. They had that thing locked down. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. But I think you know, thinking about devices like that, yeah. you know, looking to the residential market is really interesting. So mm -hmm. think about things like the Nest thermostat and the Ecobee thermostat. You know, and and Ecobee does you know what we kind of already do in commercial buildings, where you know they have your main thermostat at your house, but they also have sensors that, that, you know, detect if somebody's in a room, then they'll average those out and kind of control your furnace based on that. So do, do you have a nest? I have an Ecobee. You have an Ecobee? Yeah. Do you have a nest? We have no smart devices <laughs> okay. in my house. Like, and it's <laughs> like, very yeah. intentional. Yeah. <laughs> like no it's Alexas or anything? No Alexas. No Alexas. No, they, yeah. I mean, we have like modern TVs, which are probably <laughs> listening to every conversation, but yeah, we have. But no other. We, yeah. Hmm, that is going to be a topic for you guys to talk about, right? <laughs> yeah, <definitely. laughs> Which is like, you know, we, I mean, then it's kind of an interesting, um, I would say, debate to be had, especially with folks among kind of technology crowd. Like, if you're a technology enthusiast, you want to adopt the latest and greatest right. stuff and like have like, I mean, Nest is really cool. Like these, these uh, you know, Lex is really cool. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But... but <laughs> But I mean, there's the you classic. You have to read the fine print, you know. Oh yeah. And, well, like, there's the change the password and like <laughs> do right. the basic stuff. I mean, like on your router, right? Like on your <laughs> default password. Yeah. Password. Well, there's there's that there's that meme. That it's one of my favorite memes. It's like um, it's like showing a uh, a woman on a call in like 1950s, 1960s, <clears> and she's <throat> like, oh, I don't know if we're being wiretapped. Zoom ahead to the year 2018. Uh, a woman in the house, like, hi, wiretap, please order me uh, these <laughs> right. various things. And you're, you're just like, oh, boy. Yeah. Yep. I know. Yeah. It's like, um, I don't know how you guys feel about, you know, the targeted ads, right, online. Like, mm -hmm. part, you know, part of me is like, well, targeted ads, I don't want them getting my information and targeting ads to yeah. me. But the other part of me is like, well, if I want the thing, like, they're yeah. going to try to sell me <laughs> stuff no matter what, right? Like, it might as well be something I want or right. need or think I need. Like. Yeah. It's gotten so. to the point where I, I actually enjoy the ones that are 
clearly wrong. Yeah. Like it's clearly a, a, a men's item that I'm not going to need. Like what? Like a man, like a men's <laughs> item. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, I'm, it could be. I'm like, I, I'm speculating. I don't know. Like, <laughs> not like, like a uh, beard trimmer. Yes. Yes. Beard trimmer. <laughs> right. And I think it was because I was, <laughs> you're welcome. <laughs> like, Thanks for bailing me out. Yeah. <laughs> I was listening to a podcast where they were talking about how there was a scientific study of comparing the bacteria in men's beards versus dog's fur for MRI machines. I don't have this problem and, anywhere on my head. Right. And the men had more germs than the dogs. Than the dogs. Well, yeah. I'm going to keep that in mind. So, I, so then I got an advertisement <laughs> for a beard I'm trimmer. Cutt- cuddling yeah. with my yes. puppy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm. I'm glad so you're not clean. another man's beard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you for not being a beard. I had like another weird one like that yesterday. We're, we were, uh, I mentioned the water sommelier thing earlier, right? So we're getting like a water purification, drinking water system for our office. And um, we're also going to do like a bottled water to blind taste test, uh-huh. I think. So stay Ooh. tuned for that. Um, but the but the guy, the sales guy said, um, this, "This water straight from Missouri is the yeah, best." Er, there was, er, <laughs> but there was one of those like a study showed that you know. So he said a study showed that I'm going to try to remember it. It was like the dirtiest the dirtiest thing in your house is like your kitchen faucet followed by the bathroom faucet and then the toilet. Oh. I was like, what? Like, but, you know, I don't know. He's like, well, think about it. Like, you clean you clean the toilet, you know, however often. You know, you clean the faucet in the bathroom. Like, how often do you, like, clean, like, the water? He's talking about the water side the, of the oh, underside. The that, yeah. The, right. And I'm like, well, I mean, you have to clean out the aerator and do that. You know, yeah. so he's typically a different audience. <laughs> he's given that spiel to, but, yeah. yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Today you learned... It's hot in July. Mm-hmm. Clean your aerator. Clear your aerator. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And shave your beard. Shave it. Shave it. <laughs> or at least clean it. <laughs> clean your beard. Oh, man. That's staying in. Um, <laughs> mark on this moment. Yeah. Oh, um, so rewinding a bit. Uh-huh. Yeah. How did you get into engineering? Well, I, I think I'm uh, blessed and cursed with having a lot of different interests. And so my parents tell this story. I mean, like most engineers, it's like, oh, I always love science and math, right? Like that's the uh-huh. kind of the can. Why are you an engineering answer? Um, my parents tell a story that when I was talking about majors for college, I told them I wanted to major in either art or engineering. They were like, maybe engineering would be a good <laughs> long-term career for you. <laughs> So I kind of just, I just picked mechanical engineering. Like I went to Iowa State for mechanical engineering. Uh-huh. So like a lot of my um, coworkers went through um, architectural engineering programs. So I was just a straight up mechanical engineer. I didn't take any like HVAC design classes. I was taking like uh, alternative energy and independent study courses. And I had internships at like John Deere and Mid-American mm-hmm. Energy. So I started... Um, you know, working in the industry and it was like, I couldn't read floor plans. I didn't know anything (laughs) about that, but I mean, it actually, it worked out really well that I got into, into this industry, I think, because it kind of bridges that gap to my other interest and passion, which is like sustainable design. And Uh so my, uh, my father was the state director for the nature conservancy in Nebraska for like 25 years. So that's why we moved here originally from Minnesota he was like managing a nature center there yeah. and then he moved here, worked for the nature conservancy. So yeah. So I, I kind of always had that interest in the natural environment and nature. And so I think working as an engineer in our industry, like there's mm-hmm. a lot of like logical synergies that happen there. So, mm-hmm. I mean, you know, so I still have like the engineer mindset of like wanting to fix problems and come up with solutions and, do math. (laughs) So, (laughs) I mean, I enjoy all that too, but, um, you know, I think there's, there's the artistic way to do it. There's Uh a creative way to do it. There's, you know, communication, like effective communication and visual presentation. And there's a lot of betterments that, Mm -hmm. you know, I think we can, we can bring to the industry in general. And how did, how did you end up at Morrissey? Um, I was at Alvine engineering when I started out of school. So I was there two years um, and one of my mentors um, that was at Alvine, actually, when I started, was working at Morrissey. 
Okay. So I, um, at the time, was um, you know considering a job change for another firm and went to this mentor uh, to say, hey, what do you think? What should I do? And he was like, maybe you should come work at Morrissey. There's a third <laughs> option. You're right. <laughs> you know, when you're like two years out of college, you don't really realize that's where that conversation is going to yeah. go. But yeah. <laughs> so yeah, that's how that happened. Yeah. Nice. So. That's great. And then, then you, 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 you went to work for a, uh, a startup for a bit. Yeah. Like energy and energy, energy modeling. Energy studio. Yeah. yeah. And, and they do, they just do energy modeling like all the time. Uh, and kind of the business proposition there for them is that, you know, oftentimes, and it, and it grew out of energy modeling for lead, right? Because that, okay. that's a kind of a big, it can be a big burdensome process for engineering firms. Like typically energy modeling falls to the mechanical engineer, the engineering firm. And if that, person isn't super familiar with energy modeling, it uh -huh. can become like a chore. And, yeah. and at that phase, it's not necessarily used as a design tool. Like we talked about early phase conceptual modeling right. and that's, you know, cyclical process. It's not that it's just a task, mm -hmm. right? That it's like a, a documentation. documentation. Yep. Mm -hmm. So, you know, whether it's for lead or for energy code compliance or whatever, mm -hmm. um, it can, it can be burdensome, um, for firms. And so that's what energy studio kind of came about to solve that pain point. And do fill think, in that gap. Do you think? Do you think it? You think it speaks to? Yeah, you kind of mentioned fill in the gap. I mean, right. I think we can very much relate to that in terms Absolutely. of like tech, technological skill sets, yeah. um, sort of more uh, advanced um, capabilities in different areas. There is there is a gap in the industry. Technology is changing so fast, mm -hmm. um, and the the building and construction industry is historically slow, slower to kind of move on new things. Right. Um, and I think. Uh, in the aftermath of the the recession in 08, you know, we uh, architecture I think certainly felt it. I'm sure engineering uh, did as well. I mean, um, we we just had Matt Goldsberry on, and when he talked about graduating in 2000, uh, 11. 2011. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Um, he's like there were there were slim pickings on the job front, That's and so interesting. and so a lot of people actually ended up falling out of the the sort of the established disciplines and started finding these alternate career paths. And now I think a lot of firms are actually looking for like the sweet spot that I keep hearing is people with like 10 years experience hmm. and they Wait, can't find that them. That would have been right about the time they were firing everyone. Right, like exactly. my, my undergraduate cohort was uh, 2007, got internship jobs at various firms. By two years later, most of them were not doing architecture anymore because hmm. there were no jobs. And I can, I can, I can speak to that from the case side of things. Case started, uh, in 2000, they broke off from shop in 2008, like right when the, like, oh, yeah. right when the crash happened and yeah. they actually built up this business. And, and now there's this huge trend of like different, I think it, it's done some, it's done good things and it's also done some unfortunate things. The unfortunate thing being, um, really talented people are not operating, um, in the way that you know, uh, would have been expected in, in a, in a firm in engineering practice or architecture practice, design practice. Um, and, and I think that talent is very much uh, missing. Um, but it's also now created all these startups, um, mm -hmm. proving ground, I think is certainly one of those where we're, you know, trying kind of a new model, mm -hmm. um, in the building industry. And, uh, it seems like energy studio was kind of filling, uh, you know, their own gaps there. Um, and you know, it, 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 it it's it's interesting to me to kind of think about that um, what it means to you know it, in your experience now and in, back in an engineering practice are are, are are companies like yours feeling that in 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 that way I kind of just described are there technology gaps or like how many people are doing exactly what you're doing you seem very uh, you know yeah. advanced when it comes to your use of the tools. Um, I and I know that's think that's, yeah, that's interesting to think about because, um, I don't know, I, I kind of have taken like a non-traditional path in the design world. Mm -hmm. Um, and so like, I'm not like strictly speaking, you know, a traditional like design engineer either. Right. Like, so uh, I think that, you know, my specialties in terms of sustainability and energy efficiency, um, I kind of come up against the challenge of trying to find information on things that like hasn't, it hasn't been done yet. Or it's, you know, when you're, and you guys probably have this happen too. Like when you're kind of at the forefront yeah. of something, trying to do something that like hasn't been done before, I think it's, it's unnerving at first. Yeah. Like if you're, um, 
you know, certainly earlier on in your career, like, you know, maybe like three, five years ago, I was like, I was really frustrated because I'm like, why, why can't we do these things? Why haven't people done these things? And, yeah. you know, thinking about the coasts, like, you know, the people, people that I would like to hire. I mean, we recently figured out that like AE graduates from UNO don't like learn plumbing, I guess, mm. or they have like a couple sessions mm. of plumbing, but like <laughs> not a lot, not a lot of plumbing. Water flows downhill. Uh, that's all you need to know. Right, right. <laughs> well, which is so funny because gra- Omaha gravity, has like gravity. the most, the strictest enter- or plumbing code oh, in the country, right? right. So it's like, does so it for, really? Oh yeah, oh yeah. We could have, you could have a whole. You can't I, even look at your plumbing, plumbing without a licensed contractor. Plumbing code discussion. <laughs> yeah. We'll add that to the deep thoughts by proving ground. <laughs> um, episodic Plumbing. series yeah. coming soon where <laughs> I'll, contempl- I'll contemplate that it's hot, you know, hot in July and then we'll yep. talk about gravity going downhill <laughs> and then this It'll lead into maybe a special feature of you talking the about the, the plumbing code in Omaha, well, Nebraska. Well, I have a, I'm already all set up for that because my husband's <laughs> a plumber and he asked me to record the plumbing code on audio. Oh, So I nice. have a spoken word version. The nice thing about the Omaha plumbing code is it's written not in code language. It's more just like not conversational. It's a one directional conversation, right. but like but it's very readable. So I have that audio. Nice. That I can, it, we can link to it. So is it is it is it a, is it published right now? I have it like on SoundCloud. This yeah. is nice. this is this, <laughs> this is, is going in yeah. the links. Of yeah, the we're gonna YouTube link video. to your SoundCloud. Well, and here's sure. I mean, talk about like being ambitious and like Chapter having too many one. interests. <laughs> I, at our Christmas party, I was like, we should have a Morrissey Engineering brings you the Omaha Plumbing Code podcast, right? Like I, I've never done a podcast in my life, and I was like, this is happening. <laughs> like <laughs> in all my amazing. spare time. Yeah. So where was I going with that? Oh, the the coasts, the coasts, and the people. Like the person that I would love to hire would be like an engineer that is, you know, a mechanical engineer who knows energy modeling and is also really familiar with like rhino and grasshopper. And it's like mm-hmm. that's a very specific thing. And like I don't know if who that is here, right? Like in Omaha. In Omaha, right. Yeah. You know, and and I, I think on, right <laughs> on the architectural side, like there's certainly if anyone's out there more that people. Joins us yeah, in Omaha, Nebraska. Look me up. We yeah, <laughs> but like I think architecturally, and and certainly like even like within our company, um, on the lighting side and like lighting design, you know, the parametrics there are like a lot more out. But like mechanical engineers doing energy modeling and using like ladybug and honeybee and all the do, animals. Do, do you use those tools? I mean, I'm trying to, but <laughs> talk about like improving when you're busy. It's like, well, we, you know, we kind of have these workflows that we already use, but like I have them, I have them on my computer. Uh, so I'm working, working on it. So what's interesting about those tools, and it's actually a topic I wanted to talk to you a bit about, because we are seeing people that aren't engineers using mm-hmm. these tools. Um, yeah. Architects are employing Ladybug and Honeybee uh, to do these very conceptual models. Um mm-hmm. There are tools out there. Um, uh, Cove uh, is oh, one. Yeah. Have you heard of Cove? Yep. Um, you know, Sapphira. These are really catered towards. Which is now a part of uh, SketchUp Studio. Yeah, which right. Which is weird, too. Because, well, they were, they were bought by Trimble. Right, right. And you were buying up all the things. As, and yeah. And just snatching up that, those tools. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and what's interesting to me is that, and, and th- there's like a, I think there's a, a real benefit to this. It's sort of the, you're kind of democ- there's sort of this trend of democratizing knowledge around yeah. these these specialized um, concepts um, and technology um, capabilities, um, but they don't have an engineer's an engineer's training, you know, um, to understand what they're getting out of it. Like, yeah. do you do you have some have people come to you with like I did this thing in like yeah I was just gonna say that happens. what do I do now Yeah, I mean then. <laughs> So there's, there's, yeah, there's, there's two parts of it, right? Like you can run a, you can run an energy model in uh, Revit, right? I'll run for like, you, run, one, one, I'll run one for you right now. <laughs> like, Just, like I could run an energy model <laughs> uh, and you can, right? Yeah. But then sometimes that happens. It's like, here's this report I got. Like, what does it mean? <laughs> and and that's, you know, where the experience comes in is like when you start to have the conversation of like, why is this or why did I, why did I change this? And is this a reasonable assumption? And, you know, Mm -hmm. what do we see on the design side? Like we're getting to a point where, um, and you know, building energy efficiency where plug load is really driving the energy consumption of, of these high performance buildings. Right. So Mm -hmm. you look at like a, like a high performer or a net zero building and the plug load is 50% or more of the total annual energy. So it's like, what uh, what's a reasonable plug load to assume when you're doing this model? Like, is it one watt a square foot? Is it a half? Is Mm -hmm. it, you know, seven, what <laughs> like <Yeah. laughs> so 
uh, you know, there's there's that. I think that the availability of those tools is good. Like having the information, putting it out there. Like, I mean, I've shown I've shown Cove to a lot of clients actually. I'm mean, like, yeah. hey guys, check this out because. Um, I think also, you know, historically as an industry, it's like, oh, well, don't, don't tell people it's so easy to run an energy model because then there won't be the work for me to do. Right. right? Like that kind of that mentality. But, sort of but a, you just want to be the person that actually interprets the yeah, data you wanna, rather than the wanna, one who maybe generates it. Necessarily. Right. Right. And, and I don't want to like own that knowledge. Like I'll, I would love to, you know. I was thinking, I was like, I need to teach a class on how to do, you know, whatever, right. whatever I know how to do. <laughs> and just so more people can like be out there bettering the world right. and getting results and talking about it. And I think there's, you know, there's so much work to do. You talked about the, you know, the economic climate being good. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. So like, I, I'm not really like worried about running out of things to do currently. So <laughs> yeah, it's, I mean, the, I mean, it is a, I'm, I'm interested in this idea of how professions are, are currently being disrupted. Right? Yeah. And, you know, I think technology is playing a large role in this. Um, Even workflows, right? Like workflows. Yeah, ex exactly. Typical workflows. Yeah. I mean, like there's all this, there's all this, like if you look at, if you look at like a system and you could call the construction industry a system, there's all these systems of relationships and information handoffs and various activities occurring. Um, and, certain types of knowledge are kind of siloed among certain individuals. And mm -hmm. sometimes this knowledge is very jealously guarded. And then you have tools that are coming into play that kind of open up that knowledge in a, in a way that a non-expert can actually start to leverage and use it. Um, and I know that there are, you know, people very much concerned about that. And we're actually starting to see this come to a head with, um, the building code. Oh uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, we can talk about up codes, right? Up yeah. Codes. Up codes. They, uh, there are, a startup, I think that yep. they, the first, their goal is to have like a, a spell check for building code compliance, at least at the architectural level. I'm not sure at the engineering, right. um, but the, the first thing that they did was uh, trying to increase access to building code. Um, so the international uh, code council publishes their, uh, the, the IBC and, and all the suite of, mm -hmm. of building codes that are fairly standard in the U S um, across uh, and, and other countries. But so they, they publish that on their website. You can look at them. You can't highlight anything. You can't copy paste anything. You can't right. search. You can't search. Right. Uh, I think search? maybe you have a search. Well, it's, it's a table of contents. It's, so if you know course. that the information I want is in chapter yeah. five, I can go find it. Right. Um, and then there's, you know, sub, things within that so um which is handy if you're studying to uh take the architecture registration exam because that's exactly <laughs> <laughs> what you need to be able to do is to right. find it in the code but um so upcodes recently published an article and there were some discussions on twitter about how they um were actually are in uh under a lawsuit right now um international code council is suing them for um, publishing that information in a way online that could be searchable mm. and highlighted and copy pasted, and their their argument and also cross correlated with your model. Right. I think that's really where the benefit right. is. They're, is they're like going you're, you're, towards you're yeah doing a thing. Yeah, like right. this is a so thing. Like yeah. Step one is put it up there. Step two is start to make it more useful and and more interrelated with your with your building information models. Right. Um, but so step one, they're they're hung up on this this thing and, and the arguments are really interesting because apparently the argument of the code council is like we can't continue to make quality codes if we can't charge money for something that um, is basically the law so and then then up codes uh, argument back is like it's the law you should have public access free public right, access to, to it. the law yeah and so it's like um, I don't remember who said it but like maybe the code council should think of up codes as like figuring out their next business model for them instead of sell selling paper copy books. I know. <laughs> but but what, what's the most interesting to me about this whole thing is the the what the response was to upcodes. Mm -hmm. Because you could have either one of two responses. Oh, this is really cool. We should figure out a way to either partner with them or figure out a way to improve our ability to monetize the service that we're providing. Mm -hmm. um, or we're going to sue them. Right. 
and well, that's the easier gonna, one, right? Yeah, and, like, and oh. yeah, and and it's who you know, wants innovation? No, right. shut it down. <laughs> it's I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I think I think we're we're gonna see that. But that's harder, right? Yeah, yeah. It's well, like it's, that discussion it, on how are we harder, gonna, especially for a large corporation, yeah, because they want to protect their their things. That's that's larger in our economy the discussions around the really big firms the really or the really big companies is like they're buying out their competition so there is no innovation you know mm-hmm. um so where is that gonna where is that gonna head us and that's a whole other yeah economics topic i have thing. a i have a few side interests that okay. sometimes come sure. into conversation right, right. <laughs> so no, I, mean, I mean those are those are big those are big questions yeah, and, I mean, and then you think about it in the context of all the stuff that you do or that any designer does out there i mean there's you know, we had we had our generative design debate, um, mm-hmm. and about you know, there's a, a side a side of that. You know, where is the agency of the designer in a lot of these new technologies, right. and are um, certain processes getting to the point where they're you know, either through automation or through novel uses of machine learning and artificial mm-hmm. intelligence, uh, making um, certain forms of of knowledge that we you know once valued and jealously guarded mm-hmm. now very much available in in a very different context and you know i think that's that that type of disruption is only going to be coming faster and faster yeah uh, i mean it's it's a real thing have you guys uh seen the i think it was on npr they had a how likely is it that your job will be automated kind of survey right. oh sure yeah those right are, those sure. are so you fill that out and it was like it could show you know the results would show if you were a total ro- it would like you're a robot like yeah, yeah. you're totally going to be a robot in the future like your job leave would it be to a the robot. media to fame ro- fear yep, monger I know look, look <laughs> out look out I looked it up I mean my job's pretty good and I'm like you could automate well I mean there's I think there's certain things that you can automate to make you more efficient to free up your time to do mm-hmm. other things right and it's I think it's different on the engineering side yeah. versus architecturally because um, a lot of what we do is a little bit more straightforward, but I mean, there are firms that have tried to do that, you know, automate the design process. And, and I don't think, you know, we're ever going to get to a point where it's, you know, it's fully autonomous. Right. right? But like there's things about, you know, if you change a, change a diffuser or move a duct, you know, then it can, it can correct for that. Right. Very small, small changes that you shouldn't have to go back and manually do it. Right. I mean, and even just, just Revit compared Mm -hmm. to AutoCAD, right? Like just the advancement (laughs) of Revit compared to AutoCAD. Like, (laughs) yes. So (laughs) there's, you know. Yeah. But like, so the, the automation side of it, to me, it comes back to like, you mentioned that you took a non-traditional role into where you're at. I think that's going to be more the norm and that will actually become the, the traditional way of doing things because jobs that people are training for right now a lot of them won't exist Mm -hmm. in 5 10 15 20 years or whatever it is but they're going to have to pivot and change and do something different and getting comfortable with that is going to be the uh the challenge for our generation and then well yeah you know what people are always comfortable with is unknowns right like oh yeah we love change everyone (laughs) change and unknowns yeah well then you get you know uh, And again, it all comes back down to what what is the response going to be, mm-hmm. you know? And and I think we've you know we've certainly seen it in our um, socio political economic context on mm-hmm. how people respond to change um, and the sort of forces sweeping you know the world right now when it comes to to sort of uh, you know global climate. People don't react to change very well. Dig in your and heels. People dig in their heels. Um, mm-hmm. They say no more. They you know and and I think that's really where. Um, you know, there's a big there's a big opportunity for people that are actually doing exciting things to, you know, speak up and talk about, you know, where this stuff could go and how it can actually be of betterment for everyone. Yeah. Um, so what 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 kind of work gets you excited? Like, what is it? You know, projects that you're working on right now? Are you looking at? Are you seeing any work out there at the moment? Where you're like, I want to do I want to do more of that. Yeah, I mean, I think. Uh you know, thinking about like approaches to design and like my professional path, like a few years ago, I mean, people used to ask me like, oh, your role at Morrissey, um, do you do, do you do this stuff all the time? Like lead and sustainability and energy modeling. And it was like, no, I, no, I don't. Cause we don't have enough of that work to do that mm-hmm. full time. But recently, I mean, in the past couple of years, I think, um, we've gotten to a point that like, this is, this is kind of consuming almost all of my time, like Mm -hmm. this kind of stuff and, and looking at, 
Um, like we recently signed on to the 2030 challenge. And so, you know, how do we meet that commitment mm -hmm. and how do we go and track the post occupancy energy of our projects and like mm -hmm. figuring all these things out. So I think all of that is super exciting. Um, and just that like we are willing to invest that time to do those things. Mm -hmm. So, um, I have a couple projects right now that we're, you know, we've got like early phase modeling and, you know, we've f fed that information back into the design process and help people make decisions quickly um, and those are still all in design. So I think we'll continue to track that a couple of them we're doing, we will be doing like code compliance models. So mm -hmm. then we'll be able to answer that question we talked about earlier of like, what is the kind of incremental change from phase to phase? I think mm -hmm. that would be a really interesting, um, topic to tackle. But yeah, I think a lot of our, and we're working on this too, like historically these, you know, these services have been kind of like parsed out from like, you know, we have electrical design and mechanical mm -hmm. design and technology design, and then energy modeling is a separate thing that mm -hmm. you know you can take or leave, but I think now we're kind of getting it, it's just baked into the process more, right? Mm -hmm. So it's not a like a line item you can just strike and be like, oh, we don't need that. But then when you try to answer a question without doing that, it kind of becomes a weird deal, and you're like, well, we didn't get paid to do this, or it wasn't in our scope, but right. uh -huh. I think um, we have a lot of really great projects right now that are kind of these like projects of distinction or high performance projects that we're doing a lot more of that. So I kind of function as, um, I don't know, like a, like a sustainability, what's my title? We don't, we don't have like a lot of, um, hierarchical titles and things. Mm -hmm. So we're more of like, instead of a ladder structure, we're like a lattice structure. Yeah. So people, how, how, nice. big, how big is Morrissey? We have a uh, 65, 67 65. people now. Yeah. And when I started, um, like, so I've been there about 10 years now, um, minus my like eight month departure. Um, and I think there were like 20 people oh, wow. when we started. So the company has been around uh, 20 years. This is our 20th year anniversary. And so, you know, we kind of let people, we, you know, we hire people in roles for like mechanical engineer, electrical engineer, commissioning agent, whatever. Mm -hmm. But then, um, people kind of grow into their interests, which is really cool. So I think my title right now is like, project manager, sustainability and energy specialist. So we kind of apply that specialist designation to people. Mm -hmm. So we have like renewable energy specialist or, you know, building operations and things like that. Um, so I kind of provide that uh, oversight and function on a lot of projects now. And if it's not, you know, necessarily me doing the modeling that I'm directing somebody else or like helping to fill in that yeah. sustainability role. And so it's not, it doesn't just become a, oh, we have to do a model whoever is the engineer on the project does the model. Though I think there is some efficiency to be gained by that. Sure. Um, since they already know all the systems. they already know all the systems. Yeah, yeah. there's that, but yeah. um, that doesn't always work out. So, yeah. Do so, you find that those, the energy models are informing design decisions kind of in a cyclical way at all? Yeah, I think so. Mm -hmm. I mean, and what I would really love, I don't feel like, um, you know, like, the ideal process, right? Like thinking about yeah. process, like does, does the idea, what is the ideal process and right. does that ever happen? But, you know, I think it'd be cool to even, we've kind of done some of these things and I have like a, a graphic that I've tried to develop of like, here's the, you know, the design process uh -huh. and here's the energy modeling cycles and here are the things that we could do with these different processes, right? Like if we, cause if we get too far down the road, than to say, oh, we're going to do a building optimization envelope study. It's like, well, that's that's too late. Like we've already, yeah. you know, gone past GMP or whatever. Yeah. So, um, you know, I'd like to start as, you know, even as early as somebody says, we're going to build a building, it's going to be X square feet, and this is the type of building. Like we could start mm -hmm. doing some analysis and say, you know, what's the site, what's the climate, what's the massing, let's look at these things, you know, and the effect on daylight and energy and integrate those studies too. And you think, so. you think like the, the architects that you work with are going to be really excited about that sort of idea? Are they I pretty receptive so. about kind of bringing? Yeah. Oh yeah. People have been really into it. I think our biggest enemy is always time, right? Yeah. yeah. So when things have to move really fast, you know, and, and decisions are being made and then, you know, sometimes by the time somebody says, Hey, should we look at this? Then it's, you know, we've already gone. So yeah. I think, you know, talking about getting knowledge out there, like just kind of being out there, educating people, telling them, hey, we can do these things. Like, mm -hmm. and if it's not us, if we just give information to our clients and say, do these things and then give us the reports and we can feed that information back, like, I think that's going to make us all better right. in yeah. terms of the process. So if you, if you had like, you know, just kind of knowing what you know about the kind of work that you've been doing and the 
types of accolades you've had and the, the um, things that you're interested in. If you were to kind of give a piece of advice to, you know, another mechanical engineer or professional or, you know, just the industry in general about, you know, the importance of energy modeling or um, kind of the, the trends you're seeing just happen in mechanical, happening in mechanical engineering, like what, what would that be? Yeah, I think, I mean, what might, I mean, what might be most important is that people like not be afraid to ask the what if questions, right? And um, my kids go to like Montessori school, right? Where they get to like... Which Montessori school? Uh, Child's World on 72nd Street. Okay. My son um, goes to a Montessori as well. Like that one? Not no. that one. Okay. Um, uh, yeah. <laughs> that would be Chil- great. Chil- uh, children's I just room. had that happen to me earlier this week. Somebody's That's like, good. where kids go to this? I've seen you there. I was like, oh. But so, so you know, yep. like they get to, they learn, they kind of go in the area they're interested in and learn on yep. those things. And I think... Like we could take uh, some of that to heart as professionals. Like you're going to be most effective working in the arena you're most interested in and most mm-hmm. passionate about. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, kind of going going in that direction as far as you can, and then not stopping at the because we do it this way. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah. and I think yeah. that's that's hard for some people, especially if you're just starting out in your career. Mm-hmm. To you know, because there's so much is drinking through a fire hose, right? Like, right. there's so much to know. And just to have an answer sometimes can be comforting, right? Mm-hmm. But then, uh, you know, I think to improve and get better, if if that's something you're into, yeah. you know, it, not to be afraid to <laughs> to go beyond and figure out something new. Improve and get better, if that's something you're into. <laughs> that's a good end. <laughs>